you know, talk about behind closed doors. One of the most secretive things apart from sex is probably continence and incontinence. And we're all aware of that, I'm sure. It's one of those taboo subjects that you're just not allowed to talk about. Until more recently, and maybe now people are coming out of the closet and starting to feel free to talk about it. And that's a revelation and, and uh, hopefully that will expand and people will feel much more comfortable about uh, divulging their problems to, their, um, to whoever the primary health care worker is and hopefully that primary health care worker will understand a lot more about the whole range of things we can do to treat uh, bladder and bowel dysfunction. Um, in fact, what I'm talking about today almost applies to bowel function as well. Okay, but because, because I'm a urogynecologist, I deal with the urinary aspect mostly. So let's move on. So we're going to discuss a lot about um, different aspects of incontinence because a lot of people have this naive belief out there that you know if you wet yourself, you're a female, you've had babies. But no, it's a, it's, it covers all aspects of life from childhood through to uh, the elderly situation and both sexes. And so it's not a female problem only. And that's really important to understand. Um, we're going to look at treatment. We're going to look at uh, some of the ways diabetes impacts and on, uh, on incontinence and also how incontinence impacts on di diabetes. So it's a huge problem. Okay, there are, in 2010, it was estimated that nearly 5 million Australians have or live with incontinence to some extent. By any stretch of the imagination, that's a huge problem. And a lot of people with that are in residential aged care, and that's almost certainly grossly underestimated um, because we've done a, we did a study some years ago and found that um, incontinence was one of the major factors associated with in, to admission to residential aged care facilities. So it's a massive problem. And in fact, the size of it, if you look at the impact of other issues, it stands out, okay? And I don't think I need to explain that slide. Um, and what about the cost of incontinence to our community? In 1910, we commissioned, or the CFA con commissioned Deloitte Access Economics uh, to look at the economic impact of incontinence in Australia in 12 months. And the cost was staggering. It was $43 billion in 12 months. If you add in children up to the age of 15, it goes up to $65 billion. And that's more than any other medical issue, more than hearts, lungs, joints, all of that. So it's a massive problem. And people like myself, Rosalie, we're just scratching the surface because so many people still live with it without even talking to anyone about it. I get people coming in with their daughters, often their husbands or partner spouses may have died and, uh, and they're living alone and the daughters don't know anything about their incontinence until they go out the back shed and find rows of nappies hanging up. So it's really sad that that goes on still in, our, in this day and age. So, you know, if you look at that, break it down a bit, more than a third of women, and I'm talking women now, will live with incontinence at some stage in their life. Hopefully not forever, because a lot of things we can control in a very um, reasonable way. And it's estimated that the burden of care of this is going to increase markedly over the next, next so many years, because with increased age come increased other problems that impact on all of this. Okay, we get heart problems, circulation problems, all these other things that impact it, and diabetes. Okay. The most common form of incontinence that exists in females is what they call stress incontinence. I'm sure you've all heard about that, okay? But it's a bit more complex than that because the stress incontinence means incontinence associated with a cough or a sneeze or exertion <laughs> impact. But as we'll show later, it's not just that, okay? The other distressing factor is, is a problem called urge incontinence, where if you're busting to do a wee on the way home and some bugger like me locks the toilet door, you might be in strife, okay? That urgency to go, for, and if you don't get there, you run the risk of wetting yourself. And that's actually probably slightly more common in males, believe it or not. So that's not, clearly not just a girly problem, and children have it as well, all right? So for all of this, what we need, from my perspective, is an adequate clinical assessment to find out which type or which cause of incontinence someone has, okay? And in that, a lot of treatment can be very conservative and a lot can be undertaken at primary care level. You don't have to see 
people like me who specialise in that area to start treatment and, and get improvement. There are allied healthcare physiotherapists, constant nurse advisors and GPs should all be instituting a lot of the care at that level. Okay. Um, just to, to explain a bit so that everyone knows what we're talking about, if we look at the diagram, the bladder is obvious there, it's a balloon, it, the walls of that balloon are muscle and, to, and it must allow itself to fill. So that muscle of the wall of that balloon must stay relaxed as the bladder fills to store urine, which trickles into it from the kidneys. Okay, that's just showing where the uterus is and the vagina and the rectum behind that. Okay, and the sphincter of the anus that must be competent to keep the anus closed. The urethra, the little tube you piddle out of in a female is only about that long. We guys are lucky, we've got a great big long hose. That's our story. It doesn't make any difference, really. <laughs> Except we can point it anywhere we like. Um, so that urethra has to stay tightly closed. I want you to remember that if we're going to stay dry. All right? Not only does the bladder have to stay, allow itself to fill, that little tube must stay tightly closed. And then the pelvic floor, which is important. That's the main big muscle that supports the weight of the abdominal contents. And through the pelvic floor goes the urethra, the vagina, and the anus. And so that has a huge function as well in terms of controlling everything. All right. So let's move on from there. Now, we're not born continent, are we? We all tend to wear nappies and so on. And continence is magically obtained by the age of about... 2.5 to 3 years, you know, you see it here, people say, oh, I'm training little Johnny or whatever. You don't train them at all. Continence is obtained when the nerve pathways develop, allowing voluntary control, all right? All adults do is usually stuff it up. <laughs> okay, so when the nerve pathways develop, we gain continence. And it involves what I just said, relaxation of that muscle of the wall of the bladder to allow it to fill and keeping the sink to close and a good pelvic floor. All right. And now to stay dry, obviously there's forces that tend to force urine out and there are forces that tend to hold it in. So there has to be an appropriate balance of the forces that tend to hold it in have to be greater than the forces tending to force it out. That's logical, isn't it? And what we're going to go through in a minute is all the things that can happen to reverse that balance. So you can have everything balanced and stay continent, you just need one other aspect like a bladder trying to force you out when it shouldn't, to tilt that balance, okay? And, in fact, the control is complex. There are areas in the body that are involved, like the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, which is really important in diabetic situation, um, the, the bladder itself, the ability to store urine, the urethra and the pelvic floor. They're, all these aspects play a huge part. And, you know, as I said, some of these problems can be controlled with simple techniques like behavioural techniques, pelvic floor exercises, medication, and then we go down to what surgical, what um, problems can be treated surgically, for example. And um, it's important, therefore, to work out exactly what type of problem someone has. So when I'm talking to people about this, I want people to think simply about it. Okay, because if someone comes to me with a whole host of symptoms, I've got to try to, to put that the jigsaw puzzle together. And if you just look, well, he's got this, 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 it doesn't make much sense. So what I'm going to go through is a simple way of thinking about it. So if someone comes to see me, the first thing I have to know is how much urine are they making? Okay, because the amount of urine they make is going to impact on how quickly or otherwise the bladder has to fill, all sorts of things. And every glossy magazine tells people to drink gallons of water, doesn't it? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Drowning yourself is not a good option. Two litres of water a day on top of your normal intake of food and fluid is outrageous and ridiculous, OK? It's bad for your brain, heart, joint, kidneys, electrolytes. Bloody good for my business. It makes people wet themselves more. <laughs> OK? So if someone... So the first thing I do when, they, when I see them is they bring in a, a chart that measures how much urine they're making. And then a lot of them have got a lot of incontinence, and so we actually ask them to weigh their pads. Now, they might think that sounds tedious, weighing each pad. You don't. You just put every pad in the same plastic bag over the 24 hours, weigh the bag at the end of 24 hours. A dry pad weighs basically nothing, so the weight of that bag with all the 
damp pads in or wet pads is the amount of urine in those pads, you see. So we can add that to what they've actually measured when they go to the loo. And measuring is simple. In some ways, you just put a big bowl in the toilet, piddle into that and tip it into a $2 cheapest chips measuring jug and write down the time and the amount. So that output of urine is critical, and but probably the most important aspect from, from my perspective. Okay? And um, the normal output of urine is 1.5 litres in 24 hours. It shouldn't be any more than that. Okay, now that's an issue with diabetes because if someone's got an excessive urine output, then that's one of the first signs of diabetes. Okay, because the high glucose content makes the kidneys produce too much urine. Then people have to drink to catch up to it. So that's a very different scenario than someone who's read the glossy magazines that say they've got to drown themselves every day. Okay? Every stoplight you pull up at, you'll see someone with a bottle of water in one hand and texting in the other. Both are probably ridiculous. And so you know, we've got to distinguish straight away between uh, someone who's just got bad habit and someone who's diabetic. And I'll pick up five new diabetics a month in my rooms just because they've come in with excessive urine output. We send them off for a glucose tolerance test and find they're diabetic. I shouldn't be the one di diagnosing their diabetes. That should be done at primary care level. Okay, so the first thing we do is get them to, if, if there's a problem, we get them to restore the urine output to normal and correct the bad habit and either, if they've got diabetes, obviously send them to, for diabetic counselling and get the diabetes controlled. So really, really important aspect. Um, so we'll just go on, and this is just a typical chart. People say, well, but measuring my intake of, I never ask anyone to measure their intake of fluid. Right? Because food is all fluid, fruit is all fluid, milk on cereals, teas, you can't measure the intake, but you can certainly measure the output, and it's the output that's important from my perspective. Okay. And then people say, well, how do I know whether I'm producing, you know, whether I'm drinking too much or not? If you measure your output and it's 1.5 litres in 24 hours, that's normal, so your intake is normal. If it's 2.5, you've probably taken in, you know, 500 to a litre too much. So it's simple from that point of view. Okay, let's move on. There are ways of medically treating someone who, um, as we get older, for example, people tend to put out more urine at night, uh, and children with enuresis, we can try and suppress urine production if we're, if we're game. And there's a, a little tablet or a spray that you can put in the nose that stops the production of urine. That's a bit of an issue in some people, especially in the elderly, because it can lead to fluid overload and more problems. So we're very careful with that type of treatment. OK, so next move on from the urine production to how well the bladder stores urine, because that's what its job is, to store it and then eventually empty itself. So as I said, the wall of the bladder is a muscle. It's called the detrusor muscle. That must stay relaxed as the bladder fills. If it starts contracting, then that person's going to have to get to the loo urgently or else. So that's the main cause of the symptom of urgency. Okay? And also, getting up at bed, out of bed at night, and also the bedwetting in children. Most children who wet the bed have inherited an overactive bladder. And most of them will have issues as, with frequency and urgency as adults. Okay? You don't have to have that symptom as a child to have problems as an adult, mind you. It can come on at any age anyway. There are other causes. Um, so the main symptoms of a bladder that is overactive like this, and that's what we call it, frequency, urgency, incontinence before you get to the loo in time, urge incontinence. That's also orgasmic incontinence and bedwetting. And a lot of people come in, they say, I don't empty my bladder. I say, what do you mean? Oh, well, I've done a pee, I stand up and go and walk away and I still dribble a bit. And that's usually not an indication of not emptying the bladder. It usually means that bladder is overactive and still contracting away after it's empty instead of instantly relaxing to start the next filling phase. Okay? It's pretty rare for it not to empty properly. It can happen, but it's pretty rare. So the little things, these things are important. And the causes of an overactive bladder, the most common ones I find in my practice, and this will differ from, say, a urology practice where they deal with perhaps more spinal cord problems, uh, but most things, most people I see are inherited. The genes are on the 4th, 8th, 12th, 13th and 22nd chromosomes. We even know where the genes are on the chromosomes. A fat lot of good that is. We can't change the genes, can we? But it helps people understand it. And more little boys wet the bed than little girls, so you can see it's not a girly problem. It's 
It's slightly probably more common in males. However, males are reticent to come forward, so the studies are not complete. Um, and this is a shocking situation. In 2012, this was in the newspapers in Brisbane, the courts in Brisbane, where this, in this day and age, this guy was taken to court for burning his child for wetting the bed. He'd probably given the child the bed wetting, probably inherited it from his father. It's scary, isn't it? So it shows how little we still know out there in the community. And if the only people could understand that they don't want to wet the bed, it's not stress, it's not a, a manufactured problem, it's inherited. Okay, and that child will almost certainly have the same problem with their parents later on, with urgency. Okay, so, um, and it's often when I see people being there for a lot longer than they, recommend, than they know, it's just that as life goes on, if suddenly you can't get to the toilet quickly, whoa, you're in strife. You might have been able to get there quick enough in the, for a while, get to hospital and find you can find a bed, it comes out, or get joint problems and find you can't get to, to the loo so often, become diabetic and suddenly pour out more urine. That will find it. You see where... The onset of diabetes is hugely important in all of this. So the most difficult situations I see often are people with overactive bladders in the presence of diabetes as well. All right. Let's move on quickly or I'll get told off. Um, there are other causes like uh, brain causes and spinal cord problems. When I, was, when I got back from the UK and I, looked, I was working at the Adelaide, I was working with a nurse, her name was Lynn, and... Um, she was terrific. I then delivered her two children when I was delivering babies back then and then worked with her. She was a midwife as well at Ashford and we worked at Ashford together. And, and then I hadn't seen her for a while and she came to see me with a, with a fairly sudden onset of urgency. And um, I thought, well, that's strange because I'd known her and she certainly didn't have any urgency before. And when I was talking to her, I said, you've got a little bit of a Bell's palsy. Do you know what a Bell's palsy is? It gives a little bit of weakness in the face, sometimes profound, sometimes a little bit. Just a little bit of weakness in her... Um, lip, and I said, you've got a Bell's palsy. Well, she was a nurse, so she swore a fair bit, so she said, don't be bloody ridiculous, I have not. And I said, well, you have. So we did some bladder tests to find out what was going on, and she had a bladder that was overactive. And I was a bit worried about that, so I rang a fellow called Grant Purdy, who's a neurologist, and, uh, and he said, I'll see her this afternoon. And I got a CT scan at lunchtime, and she had a huge frontal, frontal lobe glioma. So the presenting feature for her brain tumour was her incontinence. So you see, we've got to think outside the square. I don't want you going off saying that everyone who wets themselves has got a glioma. That's really rare, but it just shows how things can impact, and it's not just a simple problem. Infections, tumours, polyps, stones in the bladder, all these things can impact uh, on overactive bladders. This is a bladder study. Um, I've got to use one of these... Can I just use this screen? This is the pressure inside a person's bladder as we're filling it up. And this is a normal study. I don't see many normal studies. You probably appreciate that. This is just the flow rate of urine and the amount they pass at the start of the study. We put a little tube in to fill the bladder and little devices to measure pressure. And this is the pressure inside that. See how flat that is? Up to about 400 mils. This is the pressure along the urethra, showing that this person's urethra is normal. It's holding itself tightly closed. And we do a cough profile. If someone's got the condition of what we call stress incontinence, we'll see a negative deflection in this line here when they cough. So this person doesn't have stress incontinence either. Then we stand people up and we continue to fill and we see this flat line here. There's no overactive bladder here and then normal emptying at the end. So that's a normal study. Things that are important are all of these things, basically, from our perspective. And an overactive bladder is different from that. We can see straight away that there's a rise in pressure in the bladder. And that's the bladder contracting when it shouldn't. That will bring urgency and incontinence at that point in time. And there's another contraction there. Normal urethral closure, no stress incontinence when she coughs, but very big contractions. OK, that's an overactive bladder that we're talking about. OK, let's move on from that. Um, it's important to treat because urine has to trickle down from the kidneys into a very relaxed bladder, okay? And uh, if we don't treat it, the high pressure in the bladder can retard the drainage of urine into it from the kidneys, so it can do some damage there. Protecting the kidneys is important, and it is in diabetes even more so because diabetes itself can damage the kidneys. So you can see how the importance of both of them is very relevant. <coughs> 
So let's move on a bit. Um, how do we treat it? Well, there's lifestyle things like reducing bladder stimulation, uh, stimulation from caffeine. <coughs> caffeine will really only affect someone whose bladder is already overactive. Okay? It's not a diuretic. All right. Um, sorry, we'll just go back to that. Um, pelvic floor exercises, we mentioned bladder retraining attempts at trying to help people hold on for longer, comes along with all of those things. TENS machines, they're all relevant um, modalities of trying to treat this at primary care level and so on. But a lot of people are going to need to go further than that and need some medication to control it, and that's the backbone of our treatment. And in the past, we've had some medications. They've had often associated with nuisance-type side effects like a dry mouth and reflux. Um, some people feel lousy on them, but they have helped. But we've now got newer ones that don't cause any dryness of mouth. That's the last group on that, the beta-3 sympathomimetics. Don't expect you to remember all this. It's just to help you understand that there's a lot we can do about it. OK, and basically, these either block the nerves that make the bladder contract or stimulate the nerves that keep the bladder relaxed common sense when you think about it, or combinations of both. Okay, so let's move on a bit. With the earlier medications we have, this graph just shows that the, the, the people tend to stop treating themselves because of side effects. All right? So that maintaining treatment is hard when someone gets side effects. With the new advent of the one called Betmega, I think we'll find that that graph changes its shape for the better. Okay, so we'll just move on from there if we can, because if medication doesn't control it, we have to then move on to the next line of treatment. Okay, and um, one of those treatments is called sacral nerve stimulation, where we put a pacemaker in to control the bladder. And a lot of people haven't heard about that, and yet there's nothing new about it. I've been putting pacemakers in to control bladder and bowel function for over 22 years, so that's quite a long time. I haven't done any since Thursday. So, but not many people need a pacemaker. I don't want you thinking you're going to have to have a pacemaker if you've got an overactive bladder. Most people are controlled with medication and with the primary care type treatments that we've talked about. It's only that small group uh, who have very difficult problems that we need to, put, to think about something like a pacemaker. We might think of Botox into the bladder. Botox is pretty sexy stuff, isn't it? We'll go on to that in a minute. That shouldn't be posterior, that should be percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, where we can, it's a bit like the same as the pacemaker type thing, except we put a needle in the ankle here to stimulate the same nerve that we stimulate up here. It's just that the peripheral nerve, we're not picking up as many nerve fibres as if we put the little lead in here, about a million less or millions less. So it is going to be not quite as effective, but it, it is effective in some people. It's difficult in diabetes because the last thing in the world you want to do in a diabetic is put needles into the leg in the periphery because infection and so on. So we probably tend to put that aside in diabetics, okay? And also in people who've got edema in the legs, you know, that's going to counteract against that. So it's, it's a restricted population that you would think about that. Other things we try and avoid are things like indwelling catheters, especially in diabetes because of a risk of infection, but sometimes we have no option, uh, and diversion procedures where you really bring the, the, you re, the urine out through the tum and so on, which again, we try to avoid at all costs if we can. Okay, with the pacemaker. There's a little pacemaker that you can see here, and the little lead goes in here and goes through this thing called the third sacral foramen. The good Lord knew we had to put leads in there, so I made the sacrum with these holes in, with these holes in, first, second, third, fourth, fifth sacral foramen, and across those holes go the sacral nerves. It's the third sacral nerve that controls or mediates the control of bladder and bowel function to and from the brain and spinal cord. So we can put a lead in there, stimulate that, just like you would the heart, except the bladder, and control bladder and bowel function. And about 70% of this really difficult group that we're talking about that have failed everything else respond well to sacral nerve stimulation, okay? So nothing new about it. And just to go through that quickly, neuromodulation just means controlling the nerves. Well, chem uh, medication does that, TENS units do that, all the other treatments do that as well, but this is a bit more specific and involves electrical stimulation. So let's move that one from that. We don't need that. 
And who do we do it for? We do it for people with this overactive bladder, but also, curiously, with people who have the opposite, who actually bladders don't work well enough, because it restores control to normal, just as it does when we put a pacemaker into the heart. Okay? It also uh, helps with um, faecal urgent incontinence, which for many people is exactly the same thing, and pelvic pain as well. So there's lots of reasons why we might want to do that. It involves two stages where we put a test, we put the lead in and we run a test lead out through the skin to an external pacemaker for two weeks. That's what the government insists on. Um, it's a crazy idea, but that's another story. And then two weeks, within two weeks, we go back and we insert the actual pacemaker. For diabetics, though, I don't do, do a test phase. And the reason for that is the risk of infection if you've got a lead coming out through the skin. So in someone who's diabetic, I'll go straight in and put the full system in because of the risk of infection, okay? That's actually better and easier in any case. Okay, so that's the sort of system. If you look at the little fronds on this lead, they tend to hold it in place, but it, they're shaped like an arrow, aren't they? That's not a very good design when you think of it. It stops it coming out, but it doesn't stop it going in. And that's an issue which we've had, okay? There's a normal site of a, of a lead on an X-ray, which we take in theater. All right, and it's easy, okay? <laughs> I was demonstrating, teaching this procedure in New Zealand sometime before, in Christchurch before the earthquake, and myself and the Medtronic rep had the afternoon off, so we're walking through a park, and New Zealand is way ahead of us, because they had a sculpture of what we do. It's been there for <laughs> years and years and years and years. So it was a bit too good to miss that opportunity. Okay, and this is the first lot I did in the, in the 90s, um, just a group of people. It's the, these are the volumes of these people when they present, before we did anything. These are the volumes with the test phase in. You can see a huge difference. I don't need to talk about statistics when you see that, okay? And that's, that's what sacral nerve stimulation is capable of doing. Again, this is, this is not my results, although all, every, all of those in the world who work in this area get the same results. Um, quality, this is... Um, quality of life, before and afterwards, and so on. But we have some problems. The lead can move. As I said, it can move out, it can move in. I had one I did it on Thursday. I think the lead has moved out. Another, there may be a reason for that. Um, that's moved out a bit. That's an old lead, but it's moved out a bit. Okay? And this one's moved in. And that's the difficult one to retrieve. When they've moved out, they're in the fat. We can get it out easily. When they've gone in this far, it's very hard to retrieve. So. We've actually designed now, took me seven years to get them to do it for me, a difference in the lead where that f little front turns the other way, we rotate it 45 degrees off axis, so that stops it moving in. And we haven't had an inward migration since then. So there's little thing, interesting things I thought might be, you might like to see about that, because otherwise you won't read much about it. The lead can break when people get rear-ended in car accidents, fall down stairs. One woman broke her leg falling down the stairs, into, broke her, her lead rather, <laughs> falling, going downstairs to her cellar to get her booze, so, you know, she's pretty desperate. Um, and so on. So there are some trivial complications that are easily solved, all right? Um, but it is not a dangerous procedure. We can take it all out if we need to. Okay, so just remember this. It's just a point of interest to make the morning a bit more interesting. Um, and uh, then we go on to Botox. <laughs> the, Botox is sort of sexy stuff and people put it in their foreheads. Trouble is it wears off asymmetrically, so after six months their foreheads are shaped like that, you know, um, which is not a pretty look, really. So you'll see people wearing these big dark glasses around town that cover the whole part of their face. They won't take them off anywhere because it's worn off asymmetrically. It's weird, isn't it? But it does give a plaster cast here and stops the frowning. It stops the bladder from frowning too. We can inject it into the wall of the bladder quite simply and cause the nerve endings to die so the bladder becomes temporarily paralysed. Okay, so it doesn't to get rid of the urgency and so on. So we'll just think about that. It's simple to put in. Um, it lasts for about four months or so and then at six months you have to put it in again. Unfortunately, um, it tends not to last very long in the future each time you put in lasts shorter. And so that's the fall off in the duration of, of uh, really effectively the duration of action. So most people don't use it after about four years. Okay, so it's a temporary phenomenon. And you notice that graph is the same as the medication graph. 
So there are issues with Botox, especially in Australia, we're only allowed to use a very small amount. Okay. So we go down to the urethra, where diabetes becomes even more important because the urethra has to hold itself tightly closed. If this muscle that holds the urethra closed has weakened, we call that uh, urethral sphincter um, deficiency, right, or intrinsic sphincter deficiency. And then, of course, it becomes like a hose pipe, doesn't it? Or spout of a teapot, stand up and it can pour out, okay? And that's difficult because once that muscle's allowed to disappear, we can't get it back. Okay? It's easy to relax a muscle that's pumping away when it shouldn't, but if it's become weak, we're, we're stuck. All we can do then is think, of, think about you know, ways and means of trying to, to um, change the urethra from what it should be and becomes that, that's the weak one, try and change it back to that. Now, that's not easy. And one of the things that happens is it happen it, that happens with increased age. It happens with the lack of female hormone estrogen following the onset of menopause. If only we could help women understand that that area is dependent on estrogen. If we could get them to put estrogen cream in the vagina from the onset of menopause, we wouldn't see that probably, except in diabetics. Because in diabetes, the peripheral nerves die off, if especially if they're poorly controlled or severe type 2. Um, and then we've got a different reason for that lack of closure and again, but it's still difficult to get back. So then we have to look at ways and means, and we can inject some paste into the wall of the urethra halfway along its length to try to get some closure. Three, in three positions around the circumference, and you can see that that urethra is probably going to be more watertight than this one. Okay? And so this next photo is someone who was an incompetent urethra of injecting here. You can see it's sort of balloon, it's ballooned out there a bit. And that's after two injections, so I'll put a third one in and we'll get some better closure. Okay, so it's empirical, we're not replacing muscle, we're just trying to get what it, some closure so that whatever's left there in terms of muscle function may be more effective. And we do get success rates with that, even though it's a very difficult problem to deal with. Um, I've got down the bottom there, fistulae. That's where you get a hole from the bladder or uh, into the into the vagina and so on, or from the urethra into the vagina. I'm not going to go into that in any detail. It's not very common in our society, but in areas where childbirth is really traumatic, um, which is up north of Australia or in Africa, then these things become more common. Curiously, I tried to get some figures on that for the north of Australia, and the government would not give me anything. Okay, this was some years ago when we were about to have a conference in Alice Springs, and I wanted to present this data and I was not allowed to have any data at all. Interesting, isn't it? Mm. Now, the urethra can be torn away from its supports. It should be fixed up behind the pubic bone. And if it's torn away from its supports, that encourages a spurt of urine at the instant of a cough or a sneeze, which is that condition of stress incontinence. Not just the fact that people say they wet themselves with a cough or a sneeze. An overactive bladder can cause that, a weak sphincter can cause that. But if the urethra is torn away from its supports, usually by childbirth, but not always, that will lead to the condition of stress incontinence, which is the one we want to we, we will think about treating in other ways. Um, so if we look at that, you can see where the pelvic floor is, down that red thing down the bottom, and, and the urethra, oops, wrong one, well supported here behind the pubic bone. There's ligaments here called the pubourethral ligaments that hold it there. If they're torn, the urethra will then, th then fall down. See how that one's fallen down almost below the pelvic floor? And when that happens, the increased abdominal pressure at the time of the cough will end, end up resulting in a spurt of urine or a jump or, a, or suddenly lifting or something like that, impact. And so you can see straight away that there's, if that's the case, we've got to correct all of that. Okay. And so the conservative options we always try are working on the pelvic floor to see if by improving the tone of the pelvic floor we can lift things up to support and help. Some people that's effective. Other people, we need more than that. We need to surgically fix the, or support the urethra to try to stop it from coming down. Okay? And there are ways and means of doing that. Okay? But we don't want to operate unless we are absolutely certain that that's the problem we're dealing with. And it is imperative that someone has a, what we call a urodynamic study prior to any consideration of surgery because the symptoms alone don't tell us what the problems are.
So very, very important. That's the end of the line when all else fails, and we, but you must operate on the right thing. Okay? So think first and cut later is a very good philosophy. And uh, consider all the other modalities of treatment first. Really important. And diagnose the cause. Okay? Um, just talking about lifestyle factors, and we're talking about treating all the modalities. You can see there the things that we all enjoy. Taking everything that's pleasurable out of life helps these things. Um, so you just sit at home drinking water, a bit, bit of water, not too much, and watching the ABC. Okay, <laughs> I've got a toilet there on legs because as people get older, they can't run to the toilet. The toilet needs to run to them. I'm thinking of, of designing a toilet that's a robotic <laughs> toilet, that they, it goes back to its home, charges up, and then a button on the bed when they need it, it just comes out and sits <laughs> by the bed. I just need some finance. If anyone's got any money, they can help me with that. Okay. Just a bit about going over again how diabetes can affect all of this and because it's really important, and that's what we're here for. Um, there is a strong association, as you've probably gathered from the talk so far, between diabetes and incontinence. There are factors associated with diabetes that lead to more worsening of the incontinence, and that's important. Whether it's the nerve endings dropping off, whether it's the large urine output, all those sorts of things. But there's also other issues. Um, there's erectile dysfunction in a female as well. Females get the erection just the same as men do, all right? except the clitoris becomes erect and the engorgement is internal rather than external. At my age, it all doesn't matter anyway, but you know, for, for those who are okay, it's, it's, in the female, it's internal. But it's the same erection, and trying to achieve an orgasm if you don't get that erection is just as hard as a male trying to achieve an orgasm without an erection. Okay? And that, the nerve, peripheral nerves dying off with diabetes can encourage that weakness, that inability, the lack of engorgement, because it's all nerve stimulated. And so that's a problem. Lack of oestrogen in that area in the female also tends to encourage that problem, because with menopause, not only does the hypothalamic part of the brain, the computer back there, say this person doesn't need this area for reproduction anymore, so shuts the blood supply down, it's also dependent on oestrogen and the lack of oestrogen causes deterioration as well. So very, very important. So there are big issues in terms of sexual function as well uh, associated with diabetes and that happens to the male and the female. Kim will no doubt talk about that. Um, so problems are more prevalent but also infection tendencies. We all know that diabetics unfortunately have a higher risk of infections of all sorts, and that includes urinary tract infections. A urinary tract infection will then worsen every other aspect of continence control as well because the whole of the wall of the bladder is inflamed. People think that a urinary tract infection means bacteria in the urine. No, it doesn't. There's bacteria in the female bladder all the time. Okay? But the urothelium, the inside lining of the bladder, tends to stop the bacteria from getting into the wall of the bladder. But when it does get into the wall of the bladder and multiply. The body sets up an inflammatory response, so the whole of the wall of the bladder becomes infected and inflamed. That's a urinary tract infection. Okay? So then people will not only have the symptoms, although with diabetes they don't get so many symptoms as they get older because the nerves have died off. And so smelly urine, suddenly deteriorating their, their uh, sim other symptoms and then con continence control can indicate infection. Um, and that's important because then people are told, well, you've got to drink lots of water to flush this infection out. It's not in the urine. It's in the wall of the bladder. So doing that is a bit like spraining your ankle and running on it. It's not absolute nonsense. And with diabetics already tending to produce too much urine, please don't do that. Um, so you need appropriate antibiotic, but you also have to look at why does someone vulnerable enough to get an infection. The bad antibiotics are just the Band-Aid. You need to look. If they're postmenopausal, are the tissues lacking in estrogen? Are they under stress? All those sorts of things. Is the diabetes poorly controlled? All those things are important. Okay? Um, and symptoms are much more common in people who are obese. Okay? Um, those studies have been done. Trying to get that aspect under control is hugely important. 
So let's just move on a bit. We've told, we know that obesity and diabetes is not a good bet. For, I don't have to tell you anything about that, but over, overweight also provides, provides increased abdominal pressure, increased expulsive force, and increased incontinence. So there are so many areas where these uh, problems overlap. Okay. Um, we've mentioned this before, so I'll skip over that. Uh, and the reduced sensation as well uh, is important. Okay, skin problems as well. Diabetes and vulval skin issues are huge. And, uh, and then if you add urine onto that, it's just diabolical. And uh, so we've got to look at all the aspects involved and try to improve every part of it, not just one part of it. Okay. Thrush is important, but we won't go on to that because I think that goes into the fact that that skin area is vulnerable. So we need better diabetic control, treat the incontinence, manage the skin condition. And uh, the immune system is compromised in diabetics as well, which is why another reason why people get more infections and so on. These are just important issues that perhaps at this stage we can uh, gloss over. Um, don't drop your urine, your fluid intake down too much because that's just as bad as drinking too much. It's the urine output that should be about the one and a half and no more than two litres. Remember that. Okay. Th these are th things that you can do to try to, to help all this. The exercise regularly is, is important and uh, uh, that goes along with all the lifestyle stuff, doesn't it, really? Keep the pelvic floor toned. Well, we know all about that. We've talked about that. Uh, and we'll stop there and ask if there's any questions. So feel free to ask any questions. If I can't answer them, I'll, you know, yeah. Um, if you've had bowel cancer, can that affect your bladder as well? Yeah. <laughs> the, the question was, if you've had bowel cancer, can that affect your bladder? Of course it can, but it also depends on where the bowel cancer was, what treatments ha has that person had for the bowel cancer. You see, if someone's had a resection, an, an, what we call an anteroposterior, you know, where the rectum and so on has been removed, that, that's right where the nerves that control all of this are, and that can have a profound effect, just like diabetes can, and because, but more dif discreet because it's often cut those nerves. Well, I've had it twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The... Have you noticed some problems? That's a personal question, isn't it? But I would expect you to have problems. Oh, yeah. But then, don't forget, there are often people with problems have problems before they have the bowel cancer too, and that will worsen the whole situation. Well, but I there is a big know, impact. I yeah. know I was diabetic too after the second lot. Mm. But yeah. Just yeah. Yeah, so it can influence the closure of the urethra, for example. It can destroy the sphincter function. There's a lot of ways it can impact on it, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. I've uh, had diabetes for, uh, since I was 60. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, eight years later, I'm diabetic one, but I drink three to four litres of water a day without any effort whatsoever. Good. And I might go to the loo three or four times a day, and that's it. Yeah, so your capacity is pretty good then. The ability of the bladder to store yeah. urine. Yeah, so you certainly don't have an overactive bladder. Yeah, well, uh, but it's, um, but you'd have to ask the question, why do you drink so much? Well, I just get thirsty, that's all. Yeah. Is that because the diabetes is poorly controlled or well controlled? Well, I think I'm controlling it good. Yeah. I mean, uh, you'd have to look into that situation to find out. But, you know, we do, I get every day, even yesterday, I saw people passing between three and five litres a day because they think it's a good idea rather than being actually thirsty. But, you know, habits are habits, aren't they? People who smoke, when they stop smoking, do they feel like they need another smoke? Yeah. If you've been drinking that much for so many years, you're going to feel thirsty if you get down to a normal level. That doesn't mean to say it's good to keep doing that. Uh, it's just that we are creatures of habit. But you'd have to know a lot more about the situation to know whether that's relevant or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the original studies on pacemaker, going back in, even before I was involved, uh, were done with people, excluded people with MS, and so they came out saying, well, it's for un unstable bladders, that don't, people who don't have things like MS. 
uh, I thought straight, a lot, straight away that was illogical, and so I started doing them in people with MS years and years ago. And MS is difficult because it's not a level playing field. That MS is going to change. So when we program a pacemaker, we'll need to change that from time to time as the MS changes. And that can change, it can improve, it can it always gradually gets worse. But um, a fellow called Philip von Kerrebrook from, um, from the Netherlands, who is a good friend of mine and we've, he's worked in this area even more than I have, uh, his comment on that was that whilst the use of pacemaker technology and neuromodulation is absolutely established in people who don't have neurological problems, it's even more compelling to use it in people who have, okay? And that would be my experience as well, but there are, you have to have a different set of expectations because of the change in the MS. But if we can give that person 10 years of better life, hallelujah. And I've got several people around Australia with, with that situation, yeah. Okay, yes, who's next? Truth or fallacy that cold weather makes you want to go to the toilet more It's often. actually truth. It is. Yeah. All right. Do you know why? Do you know why? The nerve supply to the toes is the same as the nerve supply to the bladder. So if you let your toes get cold, and women wear these stupid shoes that have their toes hanging out in winter, <laughs> and though they get very cold feet, so if they happen to have overactive bladders, they'll be going mad. But also we think the female bladder cools down a bit faster than the male bladder. Whether that's because air gets into the vagina or not, we're not sure. But there does seem to be a little bit of sex difference there. Maybe it's just the shoes. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it is a fact. When I'm putting a pacemaker in and we put the lead in, we stimulate the test, lead, test needle that we put in first. And when we're stimulating, what we look for is pulling up of the anus, because they're lying on their tummy like that, like that sculpture. And we also look for movement of the toes. And that's the S3 nerve. So we know we're in the right spot. Mm -hmm. Should all menopausal women take oestrogen or use oestrogen cream regularly? Well, you have an option. And, and really, the nurse who works for me, Teresa, who's not here today, I don't think, um, she said it's a bit like that when she went to the dentist when she was a bit long, younger and she said to the dentist, I'm sick of flossing my teeth. Do I really have to floss them? And he said, no, he said, you don't have to. Just floss the ones you want to save. <laughs> How long do the pacemakers last? How often do they the have battery, to the, we've, the, the battery we use these days is smaller than the original. And the original one was quite big, but a lot of people couldn't accommodate it. And it was too big. It was like three times the size of a cardiac pacemaker. And uh, so if you imagine one three times the size here for a heart, it would stick out and puts a bit of pressure on the skin. The one we use now is about a third of the size and the battery, that's a difference in battery life and so it lasts about four years rather than nine years. But then we just unzip it, flip out the old one and flip the new one in, yeah. We're there, we're working there. We'll have rechargeables available. Uh, curiously, a lot of people would prefer the permanent, the, the, the four-year one, than have a rechargeable so they don't have to plug them, so, well, have a magnetic sort of mat there to, to lie on for an hour a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. yep. Any other questions? Yes. No. We've got absolute evidence now that there's no absorption into the system whatsoever. It's arguable that the estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer anyway. Okay? And in fact, if someone has had a hysterectomy, for example, they only need estrogen as far as, we're talking hormone replacement by tablet patch or in, implant, it actually reduces their risk of breast cancer by quite a lot. Okay? It's a combination of estrogen and progesterone taken systemically by mouth or whatever, uh, that gives a very minuscule, about a 0.08% increased risk of breast cancer. Co co correspondingly, it actually gives a 0.08% reduced risk of brow ca bowel cancer, but no one talks about that, do they? Mm. Yeah. Uh, the question really is, is if someone's had a breast cancer, is it safe to have continued hormone replacement? And that's the VEX question. It's very hard to do studies on that. Um, there are some conflicting studies on that too, and I've got quite a lot of people who've had breast cancer who remain on hormone replacement because their symptoms are so bad. But the cream in the vagina is a different issue, it's not absorbed, of course they can have that. Yeah. And 
Ovestin cream, there's a preparation out that's a little pessary that used to come out, um, I won't mention its name, it's now come out with a pessary a third of the dose that's now on the PBS, it is a waste of time, unfortunately. Should never have been released. Mm -hmm.